Has your neighborhood been terrorized by a skyscraper's tall monster? Tune into this episode because you might be entitled to property damage compensation. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And yes, if a big red panda damaged your neighborhood, you should probably file a property damage report somewhere, wherever you would do that. And folks, I am quite excited to talk about Pixar Animation's Turning Red today, which has been Oscar-nominated for Best Animated Film. In today's panel, we have producer Lindsay Collins and co-writer Julie Cho and co-writer director Domi Shi. So it's a great panel today. And what I absolutely love about Pixar animation is even though they have all the greatest technology and tools at their disposal, it always just comes down to storytelling. And Lindsay, Julia, and Domi were very forthcoming about their creative process and what it took to make such a unique film that I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, our Oscar issue is coming out any day now, and it's our 10th Oscar issue, and it's our 10th year of Backstory magazine, so it all works out. If you've never read us, I hope you go check out the free issue at Backstory.net or in our app so you could see what we're about. And look, it would really mean a lot to me for my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and for my YouTube watchers of the Backstory magazine youtube page to support independent journalism by becoming subscribers so thanks for considering but now let's jump right into our conversation with producer lindsey collins co-writer julia cho and co-writer director domi shi about their oscar nominated animated film turning red well thank you so much for joining us and of course congrats on your oscar nominations i absolutely love your movie and before we kick into the movie itself, I kind of want to give people a snapshot of who you are and from whence dost thou hail. So Domi, starting with you, tell us about yourself. I have a sneaking suspicion you're a Canadian, but uh, I, would, I, I would love to <laughs> know more tell? about <laughs> your breaking in process, because obviously, as folks know, you storyboarded on Inside Out. You won an Oscar for the animated short, 2018's Bow. This is your directorial debut, which is one heck of a directorial debut. And you also co-wrote it with Julia. And Lindsay produced it, in case anyone's joining us and hasn't figured that out yet. But so tell us about your breaking in story. Where'd you go to school? Yeah, so I went to school uh, at Sheridan College in Canada. And I took their animation program, their four-year animation program. And I think in my second year, I took a storyboarding class. Class, and that was just a huge breakthrough for me. I knew immediately that this is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to specialize in after I graduated because it just combined all of the things that I loved about animation and filmmaking. Like I could, I, you know, you still had to physically draw the storyboards. You had to come up with the poses and the expressions and the compositions. And you were tasked with telling a story from beginning, middle and end with, with images. And, and I love that. And so I focused on building my story portfolio and I applied to a bunch of internships and Pixar was one of them. And so in 2011, I did the story internship at Pixar after I'd graduated from Sheridan. And it was kind of like a story boot camp where at the beginning of every week, you get an assignment, like a story assignment. And then at the end of the week, you have to pitch your storyboards up on a board with a pitch stick, old school style in front of everybody, like all the other interns, story artists, sometimes directors and producers sat in randomly. And it was horrifying for me because I hated pitching. I always hid behind my drawings. And my sketchbook and so this was just like yeah I couldn't hide uh, uh in the middle of a, of, of a pitch but during one of my pitches or actually just in general throughout the story internship I kind of just had the attitude of like I probably won't get hired but I'm just gonna use this opportunity as much as I can to soak in as much knowledge as I can and really just push myself creatively with every assignment and, you know, push myself out of my comfort zone in certain ways because, you know, my strengths are humor and uh, entertainment and gags. So for certain assignments, I'd push like the drama or uh, like action. I would try action. And I think my creative risks were, were noticed. And I was picked up after the internship to 
a storyboard on Inside Out. My first boss was P. Doctor, uh, which was, right. I just felt like I super lucked out. And the first movie I worked on was like the one theme that I felt like I, I had expertise on, which was going inside the mind of a 13 year old girl, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, at the time there weren't many people who had that experience uh, at the studio or even on the story team. So True. I was lucky that I kind of found my, my, my voice and my confidence early on in, in my career through the people that I worked with and through their encouragement. And at the same time, working on Inside Out as a story artist, I started a side project that eventually became Bow. And yeah, I've just been, what I was guess. ask on just, Inside Out? Oh, yeah. what, was, what was like a light bulb moment? If, if you remember one where, you know, you're no longer an intern, you are now a Pixar storyboard artist and you're working mm -hmm. on a major feature. What was something that was kind of like, you got a grasp of the process, like one of those light bulb moments, if you had one. Yeah, I think it was watching a screening for the first time and seeing your storyboards blown up on the big screen, cut to music and sound effects and dialogue and it not landing at all how you imagined <laughs> Uh, it made me realize, oh man, the filmmaking process is so much bigger than just drawing storyboards. It's it's everything. It's timing, it's music, it's it's all of that. It just made me feel so much smaller and made me realize how much more I had to learn. <laughs> well, Lindsay, I, I know that you co-produced Wally -E and Finding Dory. You've done some television. You broke in as an actor on Cars, so you have a, a, a long history here, going all the way back to your acting roots, but you're a producer on this film, and I'm curious, what could you tell us about your breaking in? Was it that you were just an actor that was like, I've got to get more involved, I want to be on the other side of things? <laughs> no, no, actually, it was I was already doing production, so I'd actually been here since A Bug's Life, working at Pixar, and before that, I was at Disney Feature Animation for... Right. A few years. So I actually, the acting thing kind of happened by chance and that, you know, I got, I think, pulled in just to do some quick, rough scratch acting. And apparently I play a overly excited fan airhead relatively well, such that they uh, kept it in the movie. It's always one of those things where you're like, oh, this will not, this, I mean, this won't last. And then you're like, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no, that's the one. So yeah, no, so I kind of always knew that, well, I certainly knew I wasn't going to be in front of the camera and that behind the camera was more interesting. But I was a diplomacy and world affairs major, a liberal arts college, never took a film class. Um, what college? Occidental College. I ended up kind of, you know, applying as one does after graduating college to like every single job you can possibly find. And I applied for a PA position at Disney Feature Animation. And it was great. I loved it. I knew nothing about animation. In fact, when they called me to tell me I got the job, they were like, okay, well, we have two positions open. One is in cleanup and one is in backgrounds. And I thought cleanup was janitorial. So I choose, I chose backgrounds. <laughs> um, and then I was like, oh, wait, cleanup is actually animation. Uh, who knew? So I went in completely knowing nothing and then had the best kind of education there is, especially at that point. I mean, Disney had it kind of down. They were, you know, such a kind of well-oiled machine down there at that time. So it was great. I learned a ton and then saw Toy Story um, in theaters and was like, wait a minute, <laughs> Who are those people? Um, found out they were kind of up here in Northern California, which is where I was from. And so basically kind of ran up the I-5 and begged them to hire me um, and ended up working here on A Bug's Life and then kind of have been here ever since. And your impact as as a voice actor carried over into the Cars <laughs> video game as well. Um, Dude, just to, I know. Wow. Just, just to tell people it didn't end in just the movie. You you had oh, to no. carry it over. Ratatouille. I was in Ratatouille. I mean, yep. <laughs> well, so what was what was a favorite moment for you when you were producing Wally? -E? What was something that you remember was kind of, hey, you know what? I think this is going to work, or your most surreal day on it. That one was pretty amazing as a as a film. It was one of those films that when you tried to explain it to somebody before it was out, they were like, "I don't what? It's a trash compactor? What are you talking?" <laughs> Nothing about it kind of worked on the page in some ways, um, but it was so much about kind of obviously the emotions and the the kind of acting of that of that character. And I don't know, probably my favorite. I'll say this all the time. I, one of my favorite parts of, of certainly of. Wally 
Wally, but in general is the music and um, getting a chance to work with Tom Newman and his amazing score on that film. It's always a moment, I think partially because it means we're close to being done. So that always feels good uh, when you get to hear the music going, but also it's something as a producer, it's one of those, you just get to sit there and listen to this amazing orchestra put music to something you've been working on for three or four years. So I think that's just, I think it's just a, one example of what is kind of an, a career filled with some pretty, some pretty memorable times. Yeah. Julia, breaking in for you, where'd you go to school? Did you study writing and tell um, us about your path? So I started off thinking I'd be an academic. So I was like an English major, um, but I did start writing plays in college. And I don't know, the thing is, I really can't tell anyone how to become a writer at Pixar because like it was so not what I ever dreamed I would end up doing. So I, I started off just doing more playwriting and went to NYU and was just a writer in New York for a while. And Did then I studied film up- at NYU. I didn't, but I was in the same building as the film department. We were all okay. in the same um, Tisch building. And so I would ride the elevator and it was kind of great because every floor led out and be like the acting floor, the writing floor. Um, so it was a lot of energy and very inspiring. Um, so I did that and then I ended up in LA and I thought I would get into television and I did eventually and I wrote on a bunch of TV shows. But then funny enough, it was my playwriting connection that led me to Pixar because um, the head of development at the time, Mary Coleman, had done theater uh, in her youth. And so I think she just had a soft spot for playwrights. And so I think in some ways for me as playwriting plus TV writing, that kind of led me to get read at Pixar. And um, the funny thing is you can't submit, they find you. So right. um, it was purely like they reached out and read my stuff and then brought me to interview at Pixar. And then I was on this little path that eventually led me to Domi and Lindsay. And well, you, so um, just as we say in journalism, you kind of buried the lead a little there. You didn't just write on TV, you wrote on Fringe, Big Love, Betrayal, Halt and Catch Fire. You you wrote on some great shows. Yeah. I guess as an outsider looking in, what, what would you say is, is, is a difference that you've noticed about the way Pixar functions for storytelling? Because I've always admired that they have a dedicated storytelling department. And it's it's very important, but it's it's a wild process as we'll continue to discover in this conversation. Yeah, it's a super wild process. And it's actually like no other process anywhere else. I don't think it's like any other job in screenwriting or in television writing or in playwriting for that matter. And I think its uniqueness is partly what makes it such an exciting job because I literally felt like I was showing up for my first day and thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never written for feature animation before. I've never been part of even a company like this before because, you know, Know, writing in television, it's very project based, and you sort of leap from you know room to room. So uh, I came in really not knowing what I was doing, and it was like trying to take a drink from a fire hose. It was just like, oh my god, there's so much new stuff, so many new people doing so many different things that have no equivalent in live action. So it was very exciting and also just extremely challenging. And I think it was definitely one of the hardest and best things I've ever done. That's awesome. Well, you know, Domi, just before we get to turning red in a second, just I would be remiss if I didn't mention Bao, which won an Oscar for Best Animated Short Film. What was an eye-opening moment for that? And I know, of course, it was a whole experience, but you really have the underdog dream going in which you're going from storyboard (laughs) artist to being able to do a Pixar short and have it be so successful. And one of the cool things is that Pixar likes to continually develop from within its ranks and its own talent. So I know that there is an official program you could go through if you have an idea to try and do an animated short while at Pixar. But what what was something that was really kind of like a big life-changing moment when you're directing your first animated short after kind of graduating through the ranks of storyboard artist? I guess the big life-changing ch- moment is when I actually pitched the short to Pixar and they and they selected it because I had actually st- started working on the short almost a year before I pitched it. And it was just going to be something that I made on my own. It was actually like I have the early version of Bao. It was a much raunchier, weirder, more abstract and sadder story <laughs> it was a it would initially start off as a creative outlet you know I, I had no intention of making it with a big studio so you know there was like scenes of you know like when the dumplings growing up there's like the scene where the mom's vacuuming under his bed and she looks down there and she sees like rolled up tissue paper and like food magazines but like 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 food porn mm-hmm. magazines and like a bong and like beer <laughs> and stuff like that and he's really transformed like 
he's yeah he's growing into a man a dumpling man that she doesn't recognize uh so that was really hit on pretty hard in the early versions uh but when i decided to pitch it to the studio it was one of three ideas i pitched uh, and i kind of sanitized it a little bit while still trying to keep like that surprising ending where where the mom eats the dumpling but actually you know in in that process i had received some feedback that kind of got into my head of like oh this might be too dark and weird for Pixar. So I actually changed the ending for Bao when I initially pitched it to Pixar. Like I didn't have the mom eat the dumpling. I had the dumpling run away and the mom just like stay up all night crying, making more dumplings. And then in the morning, they all come to life. And then she just has a house full of living dumplings. And it's like a a happy ending, but it just feels really random. (laughs) There's, There's no cathartic moment or anything like that. It's just a pure, silly fantasy, like, like, fairy tale story but then uh luckily pete doctor heard that sanitized pitch and he told like the whole like panel at the time was like hey like that's not the version that you pitched me like a week ago like that had a like a much cooler much more surprising ending and then he like it's like he like caught me and i was like oh no you're right i changed it because i thought it'd be too dark and he really encouraged me to like go back to my desk and like rewrite the pitch and then come back a week later and pitch to that same panel the original story with the original Mm -hmm. shocking ending and that got picked and I was like oh my gosh that's crazy like it was a big turning point for me because it also just like cemented this idea that that I should just embrace and lean into my my weirdness right to like never hold back yeah don't play it safe like always ask for forgiveness and you can always pull back later but don't like don't try to do it beforehand like that's just censoring yourself and that's just stifling your own idea so you might as well go for broke and then you can always reel it back. I think it's good that you hit on, you know, the danger of children seeing food and wine magazine. I mean, you know, especially <laughs> especially young dumplings, you've got to keep it away from them. Well, I want to get into today's film. It's semi-autobiographical. It's about your relationship with your mom. It's about Ooh. something magical and mystical occurring right at the point of puberty. Take us down the path about how Turning Red started in your mind and then how it grew to something that you and Julia were writing. Turning Red was always just this story about this Chinese girl going through magical puberty and transforming into a a giant hairy creature. That was always in the initial like pitch and the initial idea. Like I wanted to do like my own version of Teen Wolf, my own version of the Incredible mm. Hulk but like right. make it my own, like a very specific, unique version of that familiar story. And and I hadn't really seen a movie, at least in the West, that explores like the ups and downs of like an Asian girl and how she has to balance her life and her family and her dreams. And I just wanted to, I, yeah, I just, I, I really just wanted to make a movie for that 30 13 year old me who was going through a lot of the same stuff that that may was going through and i also wanted to just i use every project that i work on as an opportunity to indulge in just topics and things that i love to nerd out about so this was just another opportunity to indulge in red pandas which are like so cute and unique and weird and not a lot of people know that they exist or what they are even so it was it was just like a like a fun excuse to be able to watch a lot of red pandas of videos on YouTube. I, I had read that the the incident in the movie where you know Ming, who plays the mom in the movie, is hiding behind a tree wearing sunglasses was real, <laughs> which reminds us all of that that moment in the movie Eighth Grade, which won a WGA award, where the dad is kind of stalking the daughter at the mall to make sure that she's mm-hmm. okay. I didn't realize this is a thing. Was it was that just like a ultra embarrassing moment because we also see Ming accost the security guard at the school multiple times who's trying to shoosh her off campus. Yeah, uh, the first half of that was totally true. Like my mom did follow me to my first day of school and hid, by, but hid behind a tree with sunglasses on. Not a memory I wanted to revisit until... I started this movie and then I'm like, well, you know, I've been avoiding this for a while. I might as well just put it, put it in the movie just to get it out of my system. (laughs) Um, And, and just share the cringe with 
with everybody because maybe that'll make me feel less embarrassed about it if we can all kind of laugh and cringe together. I think you made a mistake. We told a lot of stories like early on when we were just talking mm-hmm. about the movie. And once I heard that story, I was like, oh, that's got to go in. <laughs> so then <laughs> Domi was very good natured and generous about being like, okay, fine, use my trauma. <laughs> I was like, but we must. <laughs> we must. But yeah, I yeah. think that it's because we were like thinking about like, like what would be the thing to trigger May's red panda in school and 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 that just was the one idea that was like yeah yeah that would do it that yeah. would do it but to be fair I think you know and it's great that you brought up eighth grade because it's true but that dad if I remember he had certain boundaries I felt like he was a cool dad ultimately and I loved how like mm-hmm. Ming just obliterated it she just went right past no. the point of like where it would have been okay you know? but no mm-hmm. she must accost and beat up the security guard <laughs> <laughs> yes, Asian moms have no boundaries. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about yeah. the time period. You know, when I was when I was watching it, unless unless I missed that there was a title, when they're talking about Four Town coming to town and we see these these pictures of them as these like, you know, very young guys, and somebody has like a CD that says 99 concert mixtape or something like that. I'm like, 99. I'm like, Four Town is like like they're geezers now. Like they're they're double their age. And then I realized, oh wait, we're in the past. This is yeah. this is taking place like in 03 or so. So tell us about that kind of time period. And and it worked great because obviously people get it with the flip phones and 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 less you know, there's no social media or things like that. But I, I thought it was a, another cool choice that really gave a timeless feel to the movie because technology was was able to kind of overall stay out of the movie. We set it in the early 2000s for a lot of reasons. The, the, the main one being that's when I was growing up. That's when I was a tween. And the early 2000s just holds a special place in my heart. So I thought, again, the whole indulging in things that yeah. I love for this movie, like why not nerd out about the early 2000s? and put that on the big screen. It was fun for me because for Lindsay and Julia, I guess it was like me like telling them about like Tamagotchis and jelly bracelets and and also just educating the, the crew as well who are either too young or too old to remember that era. But I think it's like you said, it makes the film feel pretty timeless. And we also just didn't want to mention social media at all. Just We just wanted it to be a simpler time, you know? And, you know, a, a Tamagotchi named after Robert from Four Town mm-hmm. even complicates matters. But so, Julia, tell us how, how you two became connected for this project and then what it was like to co-write on this project. Obviously, you had a lot of experience co-writing with television. And for Domi, I'm curious what it was like to take something that's autobiographical and so personal and to co-write on it. Well, I had watched Bao at Pixar and I I didn't know what to expect. And this was before it won the Oscar, any of those things. And I just walked in blind and I left weeping. <laughs> I was like, how did this little movie? And, and I feel like it just socked me like unexpectedly. And so I think, Domi, I don't know if you remember this, but I think I, I accosted you in a kitchen at like the third floor <laughs> Brooklyn. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I saw your movie. I really loved it. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I think that might have been the first time I ever spoke to you one on one, but I was on a different project. So we didn't actually uh, cross paths that much. But then I left that project. And then I was sort of thinking, well, that was great. I got to work at Pixar. And then unexpectedly, uh, Domi was looking for a writer. And so I got to come back and and we didn't really know each other that well. I think we started getting to know each other as we were working together. And I just remember a lot of, in the beginning, it was just a lot of talking, I think, sharing mm-hmm. experiences, sharing stories, just making sure that we understood each other, that we were on the same wavelength in a way. And I think for me as the writer coming in, I'm really trying to join in on her wavelength. You know, I'm trying to see where mm-hmm. she's at, what story she's trying to tell and like get on board with her. And Luckily, there was a first draft because there was a a writer before me, Sarah Stryker, who was great. And they had this really funny, awesome first draft. Um, And then I think for us, as we started working together, it was just like, well, how can we deepen this? How can we make it really compelling? Because we have these amazing characters. And so what's the best story vehicle that these characters can travel in? And that conversation just continued over the course of the entire movie. Julia, what year did Mm -hmm. you come on? Uh, So I came on 2018. I think the project was about seven, eight months in. And then I stayed with it till uh, almost to the end, you know. Domi, was it was it kind of trippy to have a co-writer on something that also is so personal? Or did it help you refocus your attention partially as a director as well? Man, Julia made it 
easy because she it, I mean she is the glue that held the entire story together and she is the she is the writer for the movie I come in with butt jokes <laughs> and, and and punch up and I'll be in there to like dumb down the dialogue because somehow I could talk like a 13 year old girl mm. <laughs> that's just how I naturally talk um but yeah I feel like working with Julia was just it was it was amazing because she is just so in tune with the emotion of the characters and what is her deepest fear what are they going through she she will poke at at those questions and poke at you to try to get that juice out of you and that was so like crucial for me because I'm normally not the squishiest most vulnerable person so to have someone like Julia poke me to get the story juice out was very much needed and it's like Julia said like it's There was just a lot of conversation in the beginning to try to get to know each other's styles and for her to also like process my eccentricities (laughs) as well. The the film came out in 2022. You guys were working on it in 2018 and you already had a draft. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, did you then break things down into a new outline? Did you really start at that level of kind of re-outlining? We sort of went back to cards. Like I felt like we ended up we had a very different plot than the plot that we eventually ended up with. So I Mm -hmm. think um, it was just this process by which with every single screening, we would try a new thing. And maybe out of the four or five new things we tried, one or two would work. And then we would keep that and then re-break. So it was just like constant re-breaking. It was Mm -hmm. almost unrecognizable plot-wise, like by the time Mm -hmm. we got through with it. But I will say that like, I think Domi also, like it's hard to explain, but Domi is like annoyingly good at almost every single part of the (laughs) puzzle. As like when I would sit with her with the storyboard artist, like, okay, she's good at that because she's a storyboard artist. But then in edit and in writing and in story, it's just incredible to me. So I, I would say that also like writing with her was just like we could just fly along trying things. I always knew she understood me. I always knew I could try things and she would get why I was trying them. And then annoyingly, her dialogue was really good. <laughs> so I was trying to make her do more of it. And then I think also... What was really nice, I mean, I don't know if you felt this way, was I felt like we were on this road and then we would have Lindsay always weighing in and Lindsay would have great ideas too. And then I felt like by the end, we reached a place where we were really in sync. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I feel like earlier on, I might write drafts where you might be like, oh, I don't quite hear it that way or see it that way. But by the end, I felt like we were all like writing and creating and rebreaking story and <laughs> felt like we were all like moving together and it was a really just wonderful synergy by the end. Lindsay, I just was going to ask, like as a producer, you're, you're sitting there seeing drafts of the script and there's this impetus to keep the ball moving forward because mm-hmm. you're, you need a movie, you have possibly a release date picked. And I'm curious about the challenge of not having a complete script, but knowing that you need to start production, which is something that I've always found wild that Pixar and most other modern animated movies do in which they have to start building sets, characters, lighting designs, you know, color schemes and everything else, even though the script is not complete. So what were some of the challenges there, Lindsay, as you're seeing this early rehash, as Julia just said, that it was, you know, a 180 almost from the first draft where they were going back to cards, but you still have to get the mechanization moving forward of of it becoming a film. Yeah, it is the hardest part. I mean, I think one of the pe- one of the things that people maybe don't fully grasp in and even uh, first time directors, I think intellectually understand it because they witnessed it on other shows. But in, when they're sitting in the seat, it's a very different feeling, which is like you live with a broken movie for about three and a half years. And that is really difficult <laughs> Because especially you just feel like you just want to fix it and be done. And the expectation or the reality is, no, 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 we expect you to live with it as it is somewhat broken, sometimes very broken for a really long time and kind of have the patience to live with that. It's a it's a really um, unique skill, I think, that animation requires that live action it, it does not because they're smarter than we are, frankly, because the way we do it is insane. But I do think that like the thing that was rare, I would say about Julia and Domi's script is that, you know, a lot of times when you're writing and rewriting and you're living with that broken version, that version is something that nobody really likes. It's clearly broken. And this one was weird in that every time we screened it, we all kind of loved the version that it was. Yes, there was parts of it that we were like, oh yeah, that's not great. But every time they made 
big changes, there's always that fear of like, are you going to start to lose the tone or the voice or the thing that made it special in your effort to try to fix the story? And uniquely on this film, at least for me, was that, you know, every time they redid it and rebroke it, they never sacrificed the tone of it or the humor of it. And it was kind of shocking. I mean, I think we all kind of talked about it internally that every version of this, there was something that we were like, oh my God, please don't lose that part. And we're devastated when the next (laughs) version came out and it didn't have it in there, the scene. So it's a lot of discussion. It's a lot of trying to early on, especially convince both Julia and Domi that we will not put up something on the screen that is broken or that is wrong. And just because we're pushing it into production doesn't mean that it's done, that we have the benefit of time and that this is something that we should just take advantage of the fact that this is going to take a while. So don't worry that you're making decisions or that you're having to commit to something. If you hate it, when you see it finally on the film, we'll change it. And trying to kind of establish that trust, because I think that's the hardest part is that as you start to have to commit to things and make decisions and move stuff into production, it can feel as though a door is closing. And while it is to some extent, because you're actually getting to commit to things, We try to be really strategic about the things we're asking for approval on and what we're asking for them to commit to. And it helped that Domi was so clear on her vision that, you know, for instance, some of the things that could take forever didn't on this film. Like, I mean, uh, the character design, for instance, that can be such an arduous process and be the thing that you're like, that's where you feel the pressure immensely is when you're like, we have to start building these characters. You have to start committing to what they're going to look like. And on this film, Domi was so good about once she saw what she liked, she was like, yep, approved. Let's move on. She wasn't like, can you just, I love it, but can you show me 10 other versions just in case? Right. And it really worked to our favor because it allowed us to keep the show going while the story was still very much kind of in flux. I just think, yeah, it was a real tribute to these two women you're seeing here that they were able to kind of hit a pace. And it wasn't just to say it. I mean, this was a very fast film by Pixar standards. It was four years start to finish from pitch to done. So not just from like first draft to done, which is the norm is usually like five or six years and and we did it in four and that is a large part due to these two that's mm-hmm. awesome you know last question before we get into the spoilers how often did the two of you write together script pages or did you just kind of meet card talk about a scene that you were going to do and go off separately and then send each other pages or were you ever in the same room for like hours on end or days on end to to lock down a draft of the script I would say all of it. I mean, Mm -hmm. like we would definitely start with the cards. I'd go off and do maybe the first pass of it, like getting it all down. And then I would bring it to Domi and then we'll go back and forth because she would Mm -hmm. then plus it. And it always was better after I'd been through her. And then I would plus on top of the plus. And then we might, depending on how much time we had, we could keep doing that. Or if we had no time, then maybe we only got one shot at it. You know, so it gets shorter and shorter. If we had like no time, it would just be the two of us looking Mm -hmm. at the script together yeah and we would and, kind of just be coming up with the lines yeah. at the same, like just in the room yeah. and then we'd send it to and a lot off. of that was happening on zoom at some point so we would mm-hmm. just be like share screening and just mm-hmm. like typing in the and i do think to go back to the sort of the funny and why every kind of screening of it i think work was i just remember like so many times i'd be like it's good enough and domi was like this line is generic we need to make it better <laughs> and i'd be like let it go you know <laughs> and it was amazing like I wish she could zero in on like the two or three lines that I was like ah, it's just it's just whatever <laughs> they're just gonna say exposition and she would always make sure that every line was interesting and that's why I think like literally when you go through the movie it's like everything Priya says is funny everything Miriam says is funny. like like there was nothing that if there was a joke to be had she she just like every like fruit got squeezed it was yeah. like um that kind of like relentless kind of rigor was was amazing so like and that's essentially what every scene went through just like re- like it never got past i felt that's fantastic on without some special thing to it well podcast listeners and itunes and spotify and watchers of the backstory magazine's youtube page if you have not yet seen turning red press pause Go see it. Come on. It's it's probably in your pocket if you have Disney Plus on your phone, but please don't watch it on your phone. Or you could get a Blu-ray of it, or you could watch it in other ways. You could project it on the side of uh, your, your, your wall or your house or in your backyard for a backyard movie. But 
we are getting into the spoilers now, so you cannot complain from this point forward. You know, I, you brought up something earlier that the initial iteration was completely different from the final film. It's always fun to hear left turns. So Domi, if you could tell us about what that early draft was and then how on the reset, you realize the directions it needed to change. Yeah, I feel like you probably see this a lot with a lot of first drafts. You just put yeah. every single thing that you love into one story and you hope it all connects and, and makes sense, but it doesn't. And it usually just feels like a lot of cool ideas with kind of a vague thread through them. And that's basically what the first draft was. It was it was fun, but it was like this more complicated, multi-generational family feud story. The temple was a bigger element. It was at stake. It was in the and May's mother had this feud with May's aunt who wanted to claim the temple for her own. Her aunt oh, wow. had a, a, a son who was May's cousin a boy named Leo who also turned into a, a red panda, a male red panda. I was going to ask, and like, just, like, what happens? So you just answered that question because I was curious yeah. what happens to the males. Do they have red pandas too? Okay. Yeah, well, so through working with Julia and like kind of honing the story down she was just really good at like going back to like what was the initial inspiration for this story what were you trying to say with this story in the initial pitch and that was this girl going through magical puberty and her relationship with her mother changing as a result of it and that's all you kind of have room for in a 90 minute movie so every version just involved distilling the story down and getting rid of characters and subplots until it just became a story about May and her mother and the women of the family. And it really just made the theme and thesis of the movie all the clearer. But you kind of have to figure that out and discover it through writing and rewriting and kind of like see like the I feel like the characters kind of reveal to you like what what the movie is about as you continue working on this. Well, it sounds like film. you simplified in, in really good ways because I could totally see what you just said of this argument over the shrine and people maneuvering yeah. to get control over it and the different Yeah, but what is that about? Yeah, it's like But but at the same time it's funny because you essentially have a movie where a major character goal is just going to see four town <laughs> and are they yes. going to make it? You know, like so the stakes the stakes change to something that's very important for a 13 year old and doesn't have anything to do with who owns the temple and stuff like that. So that's, that's very yeah. interesting that it was this expanded scope that you then distilled down, as you said, into, into something more digestible for 90 minutes. Is there, is there anything else about antagonists or anything else you want to tell us from that initial draft or was it just family squabbling? Um, well, the antagonist was the, was the male cousin um because okay. um, he, he was the one that kind of like went out of control and may had to stop him and yeah and it was actually i think it was Lindsay. um after the first screening she kind of like was poking at this idea of like the fact that we're telling a coming of age story around a tween girl and like what is the worst thing in the world for a tween girl what would a tween girl want the most right Lindsay? it, it, it was kind, yeah. of, kind of like leaning into who our character was yeah it was like inform what the stakes were when you're 13, life or death stakes. They feel like life, like going to a concert is life or death. And it felt like really great to kind of ground, even though you have this idea of this giant red panda, and, but to ground it in something that feels very kind of simple and relatable to the 13 year old girl and to the protagonist versus kind of this big, broad, expanded story where all of a sudden those stakes, yeah, they're a big deal to those of us who are adults and, and filmmakers and stuff, but it's it's kind of taking it away from your main character as being the one who's telling you what matters to her. And um, and yeah, yeah, the concert felt like, I mean, we've all been there, right? That concert matters. Would you say that the the cousin character kind of was distilled down maybe into Tyler? For sure. Because you could tell that Tyler seems almost like an antagonist, but it's fun that he becomes a friend. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which I thought was so interesting and cool about a coming age story in which early on, you see her mom misinterpret her sketchbook 
as you know something Devon did to her you know the clerk at Daisy Mart and she storms over there and presents it to him and you know it embarrasses her in front of everyone and it made me wonder that early in the movie is 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 Devon going to be like a love interest character and then <laughs> this movie is going to be about redemption and I was actually quite pleased by the end that there was not a love interest character and that it was focused on a coming of age story centered simply on family and friends and, you know, guys are on the peripheral for sure. But was that ever a part of it? Was there ever more to a love story in your different iterations? Was that something else that needed to be distilled down? I don't think May ever had a like a serious love interest. I mean, she had crushes and she's all hormonal and boy crazy. And she would tell you that her one true love is for town. <laughs> and, and maybe in her mind, the journey of the story is a love story. It's her finally getting to see her boys in, in person and become a woman well there, uh, there was way. a very early scene though that uh, never made it into the movie or what maybe was, but where where you got to actually see may putting the moves on oh yeah <laughs> on, i love that you call him devon i think that's almost better we i think we call him devon but devon is kind of sorry really, no i kind of love it he should have yeah, been devon um, but yeah there was this scene that i forgot who boarded it was it yan who were it was yan struts in Yon and she's like hitting on <laughs> yes and which just showcased her personality, but wasn't in the movie. But I think that was the closest. It, and it wasn't, and it was, he was clearly not into it. Like he was just confused. He like, he didn't know what was happening, mm-hmm. um, you know, when he, she was hitting on him. But I think that was the fun of it, that in her mind, May thought of herself as way more advanced than she actually was. <laughs> I totally remember that scene. And she, she awkwardly flirts with him and it's really hilarious to watch. But I think from the beginning, it was always going to be like the main relationship was between her and her mom. And that was kind of the love story, sort of. It's the it's the bittersweet, like, oh, we realize that we're turning into two different people and we have to break up with each other, essentially. That's the core of the story, I think. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, I hope you check us out because our Oscar issue is coming out any day now. It's our 10th Oscar issue because it marks the 10th year of Backstory Magazine existing. So your support means everything to us. You could read the free issue if you've never read us before over at Backstory.net or via the Backstory app so you could test drive us. But if you like what you see, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber. And just to sweeten the deal, I'd like to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number 5, and that will save you $5 off a subscription to Backstory Magazine, which you could get over at Backstory.net, and your login credentials will work over at Backstory.net and also on an iPad. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go. It would really mean a lot to me to have you become Backstory Magazine subscribers. So thanks for considering. But now let's jump right back into our conversation with producer Lindsay Collins, co-writer Julia Cho, and co-writer director Domi Shi about their Oscar nominated animated film Turning Red. I mean, she's also grounded with her friends group of, of Abby, Miriam, and Priam. And and like, you know, it's it's that kind of turning point of betrayal, which was really interesting when Ming accuses them of being, you know, I don't remember the word she used, but it was probably something along bad the lines influences. of yeah, like a bad influence on her. And rather than stand up for her friends, she like hugs into her mom and goes mm-hmm. silent and leaves with her mom. That was that was a really interesting moment because it creates a rift that really takes that third act to solve. Tell us about kind of coming up with that moment. I remember we were looking at that scene. I forget which screening it was. It was fairly late, maybe five-ish. And Mm -hmm. we were looking at this scene and we didn't have May throwing her friends under the bus, but we did have Ming being like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And Ming just kind of being mad and taking May out of there, but not actually blaming her friends. And I think we were looking at that scene and we were like, it's not really turning because May's in trouble, but it hasn't, what she did, this huge, you know, scheme she did, it didn't cost her anything. It didn't actually impact her life in a positive or negative way. And then I think we were like sitting there like, what should it be? What should it be? And I think Domi was you who was like, well, are you looking for something like, like Ming blames the friends? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's this like sort of itch we all felt of something that needed to happen. And yeah. do you remember that? Yes, because I remember the earlier version, the mom, like Ming blew up at May at yes. the party. May, 
Ming was saying all that stuff to May's face and saying like, how could you do this? How could you like lie to me? Go out here. Like, like, like she was yelling at May and May was like getting smaller and smaller. Then Ming took her away. And then her friends just look on sadly, like, oh man, she's in trouble now. But yeah, like it didn't yeah. feel like, like that's the point in the movie where you want to feel like your character is regressing in some way that they're kind of defaulting back to their comfort zone of like, no, don't go back there. Like you've grown so much and you've done so much. And, but now you're like, you know, turning back into the little mama's girl that you were in the beginning. So we like had the idea of like, oh, it's instead of Ming yelling at May, what if she makes a beeline for their friends? Cause it was also like thinking about like Ming's headspace too. And her character flaw, which is that, she sees her daughter, like she puts her daughter on this in, this pedestal of like, this is my perfect little girl. She would never lie to me or do any wrong. And if she does, it's because of other people's bad influence. It's not because she wants to betray me or leave me. It's because her friends are infecting her mind with these thoughts. So it just, it felt juicy your for Ming to like immediately assume it was the yeah. friends. And for May to not say anything because in that moment you know it's that shot where she kind of looks up and her mom's just like may may can you explain all of this and i remember when we kicked that shot off to the animator who animated that that look that ming gives may like i was like it should be like confusion and hurt and she should be making a spe- an expression where like you as her daughter or kid would would, would never want to like disappoint her or betray her uh, so, so it's off of that look where May just finally, you know, like, like she regresses and she's like, no, I, I, I can't, I can't uh, let my mom see me this way. So she decides to not say anything. Who do yeah. you consider the antagonist to be? It's a bit esoteric in which you could say the situation is the antagonist of magical puberty and the new world that comes with it. So there's a sense of discovery. You could also say occasionally that Ming is an antagonist because she's standing in the protagonist way, especially of going to see Four Town. But, but really, yeah. there's not that much of a clear antagonist because we really do side with Ming and understand the concept of a mother's love. So was that yeah. difficult for you? And, and how do you see it? Uh, I think that in some ways we learned early on that the normal antagonist dynamic may not work when you have a mother-daughter dynamic. Because you're never going to believe right. the mom is going to start hating the daughter or leave the daughter. like Or or that may is going to run away from home and never talk. Like, you just sort of realize, okay, the stakes are going to be a little different. So I think Ming functioned as an obstacle, right? She was always in the way. It's like, I want to yeah. hang out with my friends. I can't. I want to go to a concert. But then the two antagonists, like I think on a more like sort of deeper character level, at some point, it kind of goes back to what Domi was just saying. It's their true antagonists are their own false selves, right? Like their own inability to move or grow, you know? So I think in some ways they become each other's own worst enemies, like because they refuse to let go of the past, you know? And I think that moment when, yeah, Ming refuses to see May's grown up, that's Ming's worst enemy is herself, right? It's blinding her. And then May's worst enemy is herself because she can't bear to lose her mom's love. So I think in that moment, you see how they're hurting themselves. And then I think that is sort of what kind of, yeah, launches you into act three, where they're going to have to break those false selves if they're going to actually become who they really are. It brings us up to rules, you know, because there's a lot of rules that are established with the, with the ceremonies, with, you know, her becoming a red panda and what that means. Like, I mean, the funny stuff, which was, there's always that, that pink reddish puff of smoke and most people in the vicinity are coughing like it has a bad smell to it when, <laughs> when she turns into a panda the kids in the classroom have some dialogue about it but it it's burns the eyes <laughs> yeah. but it's interesting because as you get into the rules of like the family history you're essentially leading toward breaking the rule of deciding to leave the panda behind so yeah. at what point did you realize that that was going to be her ending of you know this great saying of living with it is important rather than just you know shoving it away the way the way that they set it in that is not a piece of dialogue that's just my assertion but knowing that you're going there and working your way back reverse engineering to that point knowing that when the ants are there for the ceremony that everybody's going to have to break their special piece of jewelry in the end to unleash the panda again, even after a warning in the beginning that you only get one big chance to do it, 
And if you don't get it your first time, it might not work. So tell us about kind of coming to that ending and some of the other ending variables that you played with. That was wow. yeah. there were so many endings. I, know. I, I want to hear them. I want to hear always, them. She always kept it. I don't think we mm-hmm. ever had an ending where she didn't keep it. I think the, the question was more kind of what did that look like and kind of how did that come to be? And was Ming also a panda or was she not a panda? And the aunties were late kind of later addition to things and kind of playing around with what would be the the kind of most rewarding kind of culmination of this tug of war, you know, with with May. And so there was never an ending where she gave it up ever, right? Yeah, yeah. There wasn't an ending where she ever gave it up. But I think like what she was struggling between changed And like initially she was struggling between being a panda for her mom and being a panda for herself. Oh, that's interesting. But then, yeah, but felt a little vague and not like different enough. And so I think it was Julia who kind of went in there and was like, well, Ming should be like anti-panda. And that's when the version of the story switched to her deciding between being a a human and a panda. Yeah, the the earlier part of the movie, a earlier version was that when the temple was in trouble, that Ming was the one monetizing the panda. Like Ming was the one who was like using the red panda to like make money for the temple. And we had a lot of fun boarding those scenes of May being like a little show pony. And then mm-hmm. at some point, yeah, it's it's it was like this kind of fulcrum happened where we were like, wait a second, like it's really hard to make Ming both want to use the panda and also want to get rid of it. It was almost like we had mm-hmm. to just choose one lane for that. And then once we did that, it really opened up the possibility that that, wait a second, May's going to monetize herself. And then that was even better. <laughs> it was yeah. sort of like, that just felt much more true. And then I think we just then went down that path of Ming just like wholeheartedly being against it. And then, yeah, I think knowing that May would keep it, but I think we also always knew that Ming wouldn't. I think we always had this intuitive sense that May is a different generation and, and is comfortable with different choices and that Ming doesn't want it. But th- And that's okay for Ming, you know, but just really being mindful of the fact that there's not like a one size fits all solution. Well, I, like We had an amazing ending where there was a huge battle in the streets of Toronto. <laughs> it involved a big spanking of yeah. <laughs> May, which was pretty great. You know, obviously, elements of that stayed, which is that, like, how do you stage a great mother daughter fight? Like, in all of its like frustration, but yet kind of petty and silly at the same time, and and blow up the scale to be kind of this epic thing with like. I love that idea. I know it was great. Well, so I'm, I'm going to get to the last question because I know Domi is not only the first female director on the Brain Trust Board, but she's also an officer at Pixar, and she needs to bow out in a second. The Madam Vice. President. Um, the, the, the last question for you, and then you could bow off and, and then and then Julia and Lindsay can answer too, is just what was your toughest scene, Domi? What was your toughest scene and how did you creatively rise through the challenge? The toughest scene for me was probably just figuring out the ending with Julia. I'd like that moment where May standing at the portal with her mom and what they actually say to each other, that kind of cathartic emotional release of these two characters who finally have to acknowledge that they're both changing and their relationship has to change and they have to say goodbye to the dynamic that they once had, but there's still going to be love there. It was all really hard to come up with. And we, we, we kept like writing different versions of it. And it was Julia who finally came up with that final line that was so beautiful. Like that whole speech that Ming gives to May, but also that final line of the, the further you go, the prouder I'll be felt like it's so encapsulated, like the love that our immigrant parents like have for us without actually them saying, I love you and I'm proud of you. But yeah, it's, it's, it was that and and it was extra tricky because it is something that we don't really experience a lot in our families because our families show love through food through action through you know acts of of service and like fussing and touching and and all that stuff but not verbally but that scene required dialogue to kind of say that without actually saying it. I think that was the hardest for me. It's Uh, a great scene. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're running late to another meeting. Julia, we'll go straight to you. Thanks again, uh, Dumi. I would say that was the same difficult, most difficult scene for me as well. I mean, the whole ending was difficult. Like Lindsay was saying that by this point when we were trying to figure out the ending, so much of the movie was locked. (laughs) So it was almost like you had all these scenes that promised an ending that we didn't 
fully know what the ending would be. And I would even include the bamboo forest, I think, in that, like what wow. happens in the bamboo forest? What does Ming see? What does May see? Like the idea that she would see her mom's younger self, I think that came. And so we had like little pieces gradually that needed to all culminate in some kind of very honest and vulnerable conversation that these two would finally have with each other. And this idea of that this is a conversation only possible because of everything that has just happened. And the fact we're in this sort of magical space, like this wouldn't have happened in the kitchen at home, but maybe could happen, you know, in this mystical space. And I will say that, like Domi was saying that I think we wrote and I just remember that was also a difficult scene because the way I write, I can't actually write it unless I'm feeling it too. So I just remember and it's like, you know, COVID, I'm in like a little, literally a closet and I'm like typing and crying like (laughs) for the longest time, you know, and the speech was much longer and on purpose because I knew we would just I just knew I needed to write as much as I could to generate a lot. And I knew we would just like tear it back and back and back and back. Um, And that's what happened. I think the speech just became distilled down to the essence. But I just remember doing a lot of crying and also the, the way Domi and I would work is we would like read it as we were going, right? Because you're trying to like hear it and see it. So it was a lot of typing and crying and reading and crying. <laughs> it was just a lot of crying. And having Ming as a 13-year-old girl was really a great way to connect. And it was it was unexpected. So, I mean, it was it was another way that you kept evolving the story and evolving the character moments and, and those emotional truths. I thought it was great. Did Sun Yi ever speak in any drafts? That was another question that I had. She did. So... Okay. There was a draft when May goes up, you know, like in the bamboo, she sees her again, they fly up into the stars. Right. And she asked that question, will I regret this? <laughs> the May question, right? Like, did I, let me just make a big mistake. Will I regret this? And there was a draft where she said, I didn't. On the page, you put that in. But then once it's animated and acted and you see the expressions, you don't need the line anymore. But now you know that that's what that forehead yes, touch I means. Say- as a final compliment to to Julia, like Julia was never precious about her writing and her lines. And it's so, I mean, again, Pixar is a uniquely kind of brutal process for writers because it is such a collaborative thing and it's so iterative. And you have tons of actors who are just waiting in the wings to take your take your pages and kind of prove why they can do it better or whatever. And a lot of times that can feel like you're fighting to keep, you know, your pages um, in there, your words in there, your lines in there. And and that was just never, Jelly was so great about always being like, you know what, we can lose it. I totally totally get it when I'm watching the animation. We don't need the line, which is a really rare kind of thing for a writer to to be that voice in the room that's kind of encouraging us to kind of lose stuff if we needed to. So it, it was such a win. I mean, it's great. It happens in movies too when they say like the actor did it with a look. So I mean, of course it would happen yeah. in animation. Lindsay, is there is there a big scene that you remember as your toughest challenge? I think the one that we all hated the most only in that it just, it was actually, we made the mistake of actually calling the scene the curse of the red panda. Like we named <laughs> that early on and then we were like, oh my God, it is the curse because because it was just a scene that was very expositional and it's we always had some version of it in there everybody hated it every time like we we held it from production for so long like it was the one we just didn't move in because it feels like it's the one that you're like is there a way we don't have to have this scene at all because it was the one that needed to explain the rules and what was happening and how could she fix it and what you know and why was it a red moon and you know we had every possible version of it in there and then you know as is true often the longer you wait to put those things in the nice thing is that the story starts to tell you what you actually need to know and what you don't like what you're not questioning because at the beginning you think you're going to question everything and therefore you're packing that scene with so much exposition and explanation so it actually was probably I think almost like the last scene to go in and we changed it after the audience preview which is really late for us to change something and largely because a we we found a more kind of interesting way to do it, which was that kind of illustrative 2D kind of... um, With the scroll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do that because we were like, are people going to... I mean, you can't just tell them all this information and expect them to just listen. So we changed it late in the game and and we paired back so much of kind of what we were telling you and just really kept it to the questions we felt like people were asking at that point. So what you guys talked about earlier with, with Teen Wolf, right? Like you yeah. know, werewolf is a curse, but, but actually, you know, this is a warrior that, you know, used the red panda to yeah. defend her city. And so it, yeah. it's actually already more interesting from the start with those kind of roots. And then yes, it's, 
a blessing and a curse of what the red panda does right. to every 13 year old girl in the following generations and and boys apparently too i guess and we just played with the fun of like how a mom would tell her kids something that they don't really want to talk about so they're always like yeah Oh, well, I mean, yes. doesn't tell her until it actually happens to her. Right. It's like a minor inconvenience. I mean, they kind of try to downplay it. So right. again, played a lot with the acting in there. But I think um, I think that was the scene that, yeah, never name a, a sequence a curse of something because it, it tends to curse you. Yes. Are people right in thinking that the grandmother's scar came from, from Ming at a young age? Yes. Okay. That was another thing. We had all this explanation for it and then we ended up pulling it out because you didn't didn't really matter and it was okay to leave it a little bit vague. What was the original explanation or they were just showing how it happened in a flashback or something? I don't know if we showed it. Yeah, it was basically that it happened during the big fight that the young Ming is crying about in the bamboo forest. It's off that fight that she, you know, almost took out half the temple and also hurt her mom, but not like directly. But I think the idea was that she sort of, you know, yeah, yeah that she oh, fell against something and... Yeah. There's a zaniness to the ending in which they completely destroy an entire stadium. <laughs> and then the final scene is them like, you know, she's doing her panda stuff at the temple, but they're doing it to raise money yeah. this time to help repair the stadium, which is yeah. going to take a while. When when did that idea come in? Well, for the longest time, we had a character, Mr. Gao, uh, who became the medicine man, kind of shaman healer. Um but for the longest time, he was just a temple goer who would pray every day for me to bless his lotto super balls. <laughs> and so he just would have the longest time that every day he'd come in and like bless my numbers. Um, and so there was a version where he won and the oh. ending was just him with a big check going, I owe it all to send me. And just knowing that he would then fund temple repairs. But, you know, I think in earlier versions, we had the entire city being obliterated. Like oh, like wow. the, the panda was raging and the fight was happening all throughout Toronto. So in some weird way, the stadium seemed like a much lesser <laughs> like cost of damage. It would have been in the billions otherwise. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we get away with a lot, I think, at the end. We just sort of like quickly <laughs> well, so just to to, we just wanted to answer the person who was like what a minute what are they supposed to do about that we were like all right fine just make a funny little thing about it and like let it go I, I I was I love the ending. It's totally zany all the way with the grandma's red panda being trapped in her four town necklace. She said four is an unlucky number and she has a four of a kind in poker with the three kicker and is beat by an eight of a kind in poker. Uh, sorry, she had an ace kicker and the eight of a kind had a three kicker. So she, even in her cards, it is still failing her. And that cracked me up. Yeah. All those little details. I had to press pause to see that one, but they <laughs> they cracked me up. But look, congrats on your Oscar nomination. I love turning red. Julia, Lindsay, you've been so generous with your time. Thanks again for chatting with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was great. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to our guest today, producer Lindsay Collins, co-writer Julia Cho, and co-writer-director Domi Shi for coming down and chatting about their Oscar-nominated animated film, Turning Red. And folks, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And if you've never read us before, you could test drive us, see what's inside, and read the free issue over at Backstory.net or through our app. And you know, we're just days away from our Oscar issue coming out. It's our 10th Oscar issue because Backstory has existed for 10 years Thanks to your generous support. Of course, I want to make it easy for you to subscribe. So I'm giving you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five. And that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks again for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2023. All rights reserved. I'm a pretty easy to get a hold of fella. So if you want to follow me on social media, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. Or those same handles work for Instagram as Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I also have a Facebook fan page you could reach out there as well. And you could also write in anytime to backstoryletters at gmail.com. And I will do my darndest to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you again for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.